good afternoon and thank you for joining California Lawyers for the Arts for Video Games Part 1, Video Games Intellectual Property. This is actually part one of a two-part workshop. Today is just about intellectual property and next week will be about developers and publishing agreements. My name is Renee Reisman. I'm the Educational Program Coordinator for California Lawyers for the Arts in Los Angeles. Before we begin, I would like to briefly share a little bit about our organization and our services. California Lawyers for the Arts is a statewide nonprofit founded in 1974, serving artists and arts organizations. We currently have offices in San Francisco, Berkeley, Sacramento, Los Angeles, and San Diego. We offer memberships with benefits such as workshop discounts and archive content. So please go to our website, calawyersforthearts.org for more information. I just want to talk about the three core services for the arts community that we provide. The first is a lawyer referral information service, which is a State Bar of California certified LRIS that matches creative artists and attorneys throughout all of California. We also administer the California Inventors Assistance Program, otherwise known as CIAP, to assist independent inventors and small startups with their patent legal issues. Next, we have our Arts Arbitration and Mediation Services, otherwise known as AAMS, program that provides low-cost community mediation services by neutral trained mediators. All mediations are voluntary, confidential, and seek to resolve disputes from the parties outside of court. And finally, we have what brings you here tonight, and that's our educational programming, which we offer a variety of workshops, symposia, and conferences at various legal topics for artists and organizations. And I just very quickly want to say a big welcome to tonight's speakers for Video Games Part 1. We have Allison Rothman, founding partner of Morrison Rothman LLP, Keith yeah. Cooper, partner at Morrison Rothman LLP, Douglas Neighbors, the founder of Fun Train and Jordan Marks, who is the Vice President of Business and Legal Affairs at Annapurna Interactive. So with that big intro out of the way. Hi, everyone. I'm Allison Rothman. I am a co-founder of Morrison Rothman. We're a law firm based in LA and Century City. And we focus predominantly on digital entertainment and heavily on video games and esports. So that is why we are here. And um, my particular focus and specialty is intellectual property, primarily trademarks and copyrights. So that's what we're going to be here to talk about in great detail today. And I will let my partner, Keith Cooper, explain a little bit of what he does with our firm as well. Uh, I wish I could. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, yeah, well, my, my general specialty, I guess, would be copyright, trademark, traditional entertainment law. Uh, and business corporation stuff. Those are the primary practice areas that I focus on at Morrison Rothman. And yeah, that, that's, that's really it. I'll let uh, Douglas or Jordan go next. My name's Doug Davis, and I work for a company called Fun Train. And we basically, we, we're a virtual reality company. Specifically, we focus on virtual reality games. We've been doing it now for about four years, I think. And prior to that, I was a television and indie feature producer. And so basically I just, I left that world and joined this world, the video game world. And uh, it's been a, it's been fun. So that's us. I'm Jordan. I work for a company called Annapurna Interactive, which is a video game publisher and a derivative company of Annapurna Pictures uh, a, who produces film and, and television. My background, like Douglas, is in film and, and television as well. And for the last four years or so, I've been doing a predominantly video game all, all things video games, but my job right now is to help negotiate and kind of oversee all of the deals for various video games that we acquire to publish and any sort of legal issues that come up in the course of being a video game publisher. We're here to discuss intellectual property for video games specifically, and there's so many different aspects of it. So we want to start with our attorneys that can give us the more legal background before jumping into our creators talking about how they work within this realm. Yeah, we spoke uh, just a little bit before we uh, joined this call. And what we are going to do, you know, we'll give basically an overview of the areas that we're going to talk about. And I think uh, Ali and I might have or will have, you know, questions for Douglas and Jordan. Basically, 
uh, so that they can talk about some of the real world application of some of these legal theories and concepts that Ali and I will, will address. So I think the starting point really is for, for intellectual property. We talk typically about the big three uh, where intellectual property is concerned, and that's patents and trademarks and copyrights. There are others, uh, and, and I, I know one of the things I did want to touch upon today was something like uh, trade secrets, because that's very relevant to gaming companies in particular. Well, companies generally, most traditionally like KFC, Coca-Cola, trade secret, right? The Coca-Cola recipe, the uh, KFC recipe, those are trade secrets not tangible property, it's intangible property, and therefore intellectual property. And the other area that we can talk about somewhat is publicity rights, although I don't think we're gonna dive in that today. But I think the overview of it starts primarily with talking about patents, trademarks, and copyrights. And what is intellectual property? And intellectual property, a lot of people don't understand conceptually even what that means, what it is, and what that means is it's a product of the mind. It's something, if you're a content creator, if you're creating a screenplay, or you're writing a story, or you're creating music, these are you know, elements of intellectual property and how you protect them. They're not subject to regular theft, for example, like a car might be stolen. They're subject to a different type of theft. We have dealt with this in the music industry for you know, the better part of 20 something years since Napster came along, for example, of people stealing copyrighted material. People see this all the time, uh, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, DMCA, where people are posting videos without the actual owner's consent. And that's an infringement of somebody's intellectual property. So I want to kind of give you a brief overview of what they are. The caveat being neither Allie nor myself are patent attorneys, but to me the starting place is patents generally. And you know, patents typically are uh, is the you know something that protects ideas. And you, to understand the difference between patent and copyright, for example, patents protect ideas, copyrights protect the expression of ideas. Now, to give you an example of the difference, an idea in its basic sense is uh, somebody saw it, for example, I, I give you an example, maybe for discussion, but of the game Pac-Man, right? And somebody comes up with an idea about this kind of round, happy face, I don't know how you describe it, a character that runs around a computer screen gobbling up dots while being chased with enemies. And that's an idea. And so what happened is in that context, somebody later came along and they created Caterpillar Man. And Caterpillar Man took the exact same idea. And it was basically the same game, only it was a, a copyright thing. And the question is, you know, comes up in that context, of course, is what is protectable? What's the idea? What is the expression of the idea? And what I use as, as the greatest example of that is if you guys have ever seen a movie, this movie, right? Boy meets girl, boy and girl fall in love, boy does something stupid, boy loses <laughs> girl, boy does something triumphant and wins girl back, and boy and girl live happily ever after. I mean, who's seen that movie, right? That's mm -hmm. every freaking rom-com ever made in the history of, of, of movies, okay? That's the idea. But there's a thousand different expressions of that idea. Ten things I hate about you when Harry met Sally. Pick and choose among them. There's a gazillion ideas. The movie 13 going on 30 was the same idea as the movie Big with, with Tom Hanks. And the other one with Kirk Cameron. I don't even remember the name. But the point is, those are ideas. And then there's the expression of the idea. And the expression of the idea is exactly what we're talking about here in terms of a copyright and what is protectable. So if you have an idea for a character or for a story, you and you write that down, you have certain elements of that story and does it rise to the level of being a copyrightable expression or not, that's always kind of the challenge. And so what, what you're trying to do, what we seek to do in protecting this thing is flesh out something so that it goes beyond the stage of an idea and it becomes an expression of the idea so that it's protectable. 
And so a, a typical example of that, in addition to you know, what I gave you, is for copyrights, the copyrights, there's a bundle of rights associated with copyrights set forth in section 106 of the Copyright Act. And the bundle of rights, when you have something that's protectable, it's an expression and it can be a drawing. So that can become a character. It can be a story that you've written again or music. You are, as the copyright owner, you are granted a, a, this bundle of rights in there and you own this intellectual property. You are granted the exclusive right to basically copy it. That's a copyright. You are granted the exclusive right to grant others the right to copy it. You are granted the right to publicly perform it, to make derivative works out of it, to publicly display it. That's typically where artwork is concerned. You might grant somebody the right to publicly display the artwork. And so the, the fundamental difference, again, between patents, patents protects ideas that can be, and you get a patent, you get the exclusive license to that idea to protect it for 20 years. But copyrights and the expression of the idea, if you come up with a story, you have the right for the, for the life of the author, plus 70 years after you die, after which the copyright uh, reverts into the public domain, typically speaking. And so that's kind of a general overview of the difference of patents without delving into, you know, the technological aspects of what patents are. But they protect ideas. Copyrights protect expressions of ideas. And trademarks are entirely different types of intellectual property. And I'll let Ali talk about that. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really good overview. And it's really important to identify that because, I mean, Keith can attest to this. How many clients come to us and they say, you know, I'm developing a game. I want a patent X or I want a copyright Y. And we have to sit there and say, no, I think what you mean is you want to file a trademark for this or you want to do vice versa. And it's really important to understand the, the distinctions between these things, including, like Keith mentions, the benefit that you get from each, the things that you're entitled to, how long they last, the duration, and, and elements like that. So, yeah, it's really important to distinguish between those. And, you know, as Keith alluded to, trademarks are a little bit different from copyrights and patents in the sense that their purpose is really not to protect the creator. I mean, that, that, is, that is a benefit of it, but the intention is really to protect the consumer against confusion in the marketplace. So the idea of a trademark is that, so that you're able to identify the product or the service with whoever's making it and distributing it. So for example, you go see a I can't even identify the bottle without using the trademark, but a Coke shaped bottle in the store, you immediately identify that bottle with Coca-Cola, you know, and if somebody else came out and had a similar shaped bottle, but it wasn't from Coca-Cola, it was a terrible drink. It tasted awful. You would have really bad associations with that company and think that it was Coca-Cola. So that's where confusion in the marketplace can create problems. And, you know, again, it, can happen similarly in video games. You know, we have uh, developers who create really awesome games. They develop, they they commit their their lives and their careers to doing this. And what happens if somebody else comes out, uses your game name or, for example, your studio name, perhaps, and the game is terrible. It's buggy. You know, you're paying for in-game purchases and get scammed. Things like that. What if that happens and you know, that looks really, really poorly, reflects poorly on the developer. So it's important that you're able to, you know, really protect your trademarks as well as your copyright and patents so that that sort of confusion in the marketplace is prevented. And, you know, similarly to copyrights, trademarks afford you the ability to enforce them. So that's the benefit of having the registration there. You file for your trademark. It can be a game name. It can be a company name. It can be a slogan or it can be a stylistic image as well. And I think it's also important to note that these are not mutually exclusive. You can have copyright rights, you can have trademark rights and potentially patent in different elements of the same product. And so it's important to consider all three here. You know, to put this in real world applications since we're talking about games, uh, you know, typical things, I've got my little list here, for example, of copyrighted material. First of all, copyrights, to, to be copyrightable, let, let's just explain what it takes to be copyrightable, first of all. To be copyrightable, it has to be 
a, a creative expression. So if I draw a stick figure, okay, not a whole lot of creative expression involved in there, and that's not copyrightable. But if I put together a, a piece of art or, you know, on a big canvas, and I have a whole bunch of stick figures on it doing stick figure things, whatever, because stick figures are all I can draw, at <laughs> some point, that original stick figure, which is not copyrightable, becomes part of the overall work, which is copyrighted. So to use an example, the example that I gave before uh, with respect to the rom-com concept, if you have an idea to create a game, a certain fundamental aspect of that game is the idea and other people can, anybody can use that. So the question is, you have an idea for a game that idea by itself, unless you seek a patent for the underlying technology that's involved in the game, that idea itself is not going to be protectable. And so what you want to do is create in terms of the game, a, tip, a typical game, one that I play regularly, Ali's probably seen me mention. Red Dead Redemption. Thank you for that. Red Dead Redemption 2. <laughs> Red Dead Redemption 2. But yeah, that's a game that if you've ever played it, ever seen it, is a fully fleshed out story. The Last of Us is another game with a very robust story. Uncharted uh, game, again, Naughty Dog, the, the, you know, the uh, developer of those games, they have very robust storylines. There are characters involved and there's a whole story and there's music and all of these things are integrated into it. Now there, you'd wanna get a copyright for the entire work, you get a multimedia copyright and you can actually protect each and every element in the game but conceptually each of these things are protectable in and of themselves copyrights apply to things like source code or you know if you're writing the software it applies to the characters it applies to even the buildings that you draw in a particular game uh, if you've ever played some of these games civilization i mean they use maps and these maps that they create specific for the game can be copyrightable. Oftentimes with games, even before it becomes a game, you have concept art that applies. And Jordan and Douglas can probably speak, speak to this better than I can. But you, you, somebody comes up with an idea for a game and they might create concept art as well. That is protectable. The box design, the artwork that's contained on the cover of the box, the soundtrack to the game, all the script, the dialogue, the storyline, all of those things are protectable independently. And so I'll, I'll turn it over. I'll ask, um, uh, starting with, with Jordan, I guess, I would ask you, if, if somebody's coming to you and they have each of these different components to, you know, to you, how would you put them together to, you know, ultimately in the creation of a game, knowing you're a publisher, but how would you work with the developer uh, on that? to assemble all these elements into a, a finished product, a game. So every, you know, every time we, you know, work on a game and every, or every game that we work with, you know, obviously, you know, most of them have different developers all around the world. And so I think the big point is that, that each one is unique and, you know, we work with our different teams in different ways and we work with different games in different ways. Some games, you know, come with this concept of, uh, you know, a chain of title, right? Maybe the game was previously developed with another publisher or maybe there were investors in the game that, that had some interest in the game. So the game sort of comes, you know, in its various forms, whether it, it could be, you know, that concept art or it could be some code or it could be, a, you know, a vertical slice or a playable demo or even a finished game or a nearly finished game, whatever form that game, you know, comes in may or may not come with, with sort of legal elements attached to it or commitments attached to it, which then as a publisher, we would want to assess those and see, you know, is that game of interest to us, you know, and, and on a case by case basis, what are these other attachments and elements? And, you know, we could call it essentially, you know, legal baggage in, in some examples, um, in some ways, right? Like, and we would look at all of that on a case by case basis and then sort of do our calculation of, you know, what what is the not only, you know, potentially what is the financial investment related to, you know, let's say developing a game or finishing a game or publishing a game, but what is also like the emotional investment, the, you know, the, the legal investment, right? If, if a game comes sort of entangled in, in previous work 
um, you know, a publisher like us could then have to go and do quite a bit of work um, and engage, you know, additional lawyers like, like to untangle that stuff. So, or a game comes, you know, free and clear. Let's say it's a new idea for a game and, and it's, it's a developer um, and they're just kind of bringing us that, that, that property, you know, straight from themselves, you know, then it's like a different process. So I think, I think the big, the big one is that everything is unique, you know, and as, as a developer, as a publisher, whoever, whatever role that you're playing, I think being open to interacting with people, you know, from all different walks of life and on properties that come from all different places, being open to all of that, I think will lead towards like the greatest success just in terms of the kind of content that you um, are fortunate enough to be able to put out into the world. You know, there's a good segue actually. For, so for people to understand, how some of this stuff might come together. Um, there is, you know, pre-existing works in many instances, right? And, you know, Douglas is, is a perfect person to address this sort of thing. Douglas, those of you who are not aware of his background, has procured a license to Tarzan and The Exorcist and other games I'll leave within his discretion to, to talk about. But these things are, uh, based on original source material. I think Tarzan is a great example of something. It's a property that's been around for more than 100 years, originally started as a book. I did not know that. Douglas educated me on that. But it originally started as a book that somebody wrote. And somebody wrote that book, and they created the characters of that book. Now, keeping in mind, and I think Douglas can address this, uh, with something he mentioned previously, keeping in mind that just because you write a book and just because you have a story in it, the story might be copyrightable, but the characters might not be copyrightable. And in order to be rise to the level of copyrightability for the individual characters in the story, those characters have to be sufficiently robust to entitle them to their own copyright protection. But Tarzan comes along, writes a book, a story, and it has character. Tarzan and Jane, I know that there are others, but the point is, this is a property somebody wrote over a hundred years ago that Douglas has been received the license and was able to develop that pre-existing property into a game. So Douglas, maybe you can talk about how that came into being and maybe talk about The Exorcist and any others that you've turned into games. Oh, wow, okay, that's a big question. So uh, uh, Exorcist first, hi, hi guys. So. The, the title that we actually licensed was The Exorcist 3, believe it or not. And, and the, the Exorcist is part of a large franchise of, the, I think there's four Exorcist films. Uh, we really wanted the first Exorcist, and like, in, but it was like what, what Jordan was talking, uh, was mentioning a little bit about legal baggage. That was a property that was divided up among four or five different parties. They each had a sort of a, Fox had a little piece of it, Warner Brothers had a piece of it, Morgan Creek had a piece of it. So we wanted to kind of exploit the brand of The Exorcist, but we wanted to do it in, in a way that was easy for us, you know, and not, not just uh, so we didn't want to, you know, tear our hair out dealing with so many parties. So we basically uh, identified The Exorcist 3, which was in that franchise, and that, and that was wholly basically owned by Morgan Creek. And so we knew that we could deal with one party, and that's basically how Exorcist came to be. And, and when you talk about, there's not, to, you know, we, we, one of our sort of company, we're a small company. So one of our, what we try to avoid is any uh, performer likenesses and things of that nature that also require licensing. So we chose to sort of make a derivative work off based on The Exorcist 3 and avoided our characters in the film so that we wouldn't have to go through the approval process and all that sort of stuff. And we basically created that product with, with brand new characters that we created. But we did were able to keep some certain, you know, Pazuzu is the, is the lead demon of the Exorcist franchise. Uh, and that is not a copyrightable character. You know, that, that Pazuzu is an actual Babylonian demon, more or less. So we, you know, no, nobody has those rights. So we were able to incorporate that into the game and still keep it, tie it all together. And then on to Tarzan. Yes, Tarzan, Edgar Rice Burroughs was the original author of that over novel over 100 years ago, Tarzan of the Apes. And there have been hundreds of novels since then. The first two or three novels themselves fell into that Mickey Mouse situation, a uh, copyright sort of, they lost the copyright after 100 years. And so that's why you'll often see people selling the novel Tarzan of the Apes online. It's not Edgar Rice Burroughs Incorporated, the company. 
But the important part about Tarzan is the brand himself, because everybody has seen all different various versions of Tarzan, right? We've seen the Disney Tarzan, the Warner Brothers Tarzan. We've seen the PlayStation 2 console game from 20, what, 10 years, 15 years ago, maybe even more. There's been so many versions and there's been some really bad versions of Tarzan. That's why you'll see, you know, you'll go overseas and you'll see some really uh, bad uh, Indian um, sort of knockoffs of Tarzan. They call them Tarzan. But what you can't do though, is you cannot, in the United States, you can't sell a product with, that, that, with the Tarzan name on it even though the first few novels are, have fallen into public domain, you can't sell a Tarzan product without the trademark. Or else you can, uh, uh, you just won't last very long in the market. You know, you'll get a, you'll get a nice letter from um, Edgar Rice Burroughs saying you can't do that. And, and, and rightly so. You can't sell a product uh, that someone else owns. And they own, they own uh, the trademark for Tarzan. They, by all rights, they own the copyright for, for Tarzan, but just through a legal, for legal reasons, it fell out. So basically what we did was we, we, get, we licensed Tarzan from them, which included the trademark, and they owned all the trademark categories already. I mean, they had already proven proof of use in commerce and all the various categories, and that's how we got Tarzan. Yeah, and I, I just want to pop in. I think uh, I, I know that, Doug, you answered one of the questions that popped up in the Q&A, which was yeah. exactly that, which was Tarzan's in the, in the public domain, so what did you actually need to license? And you referenced the Mickey Mouse issue, which... Just to clarify for those of you who don't know, is exactly that. Everybody says, well, how can you protect Mickey Mouse? He's in the public domain. He's been around for forever. But one of the exclusive rights that you're granted as the copyright owner is the right to create derivative works. So one way to get around that is to expand on the original character and get additional rights in that derivative work that you've now created, which has its own copyright term. And then separately, you can also file for the trademark and certain elements of it as well, which has an indefinite duration. So it's not subject to public domain. Public domain is a copyright concept. So, you know, that's exactly what Douglas just explained as it relates to Tarzan and what happened with Mickey Mouse is, you know, there's, there's ways around it and ways to uh, quote unquote extend that, that term of protection for these, these really important and influential characters. What they did in that context was Somebody, Walt Disney himself probably, uh, you know, there was originally, there was a copyright because it was artwork, the original mouse and the characters, the black and white, the old thing, and all that stuff was copyrightable and mm. it was copyrighted. And then I'll flesh that out in just a second. But what happened was they realized that eventually I'm going to die, uh, Walt Disney. Uh, and that copyright will expire. Back, back then, it was a much shorter term than, than the existing term. And because there was finality to that, and that would fall into the public domain, they, they decided, aha, if we trademark this and we use Mickey Mouse in connection with the Disney goods and services, we can continue to use that mark exclusively for the life of Disney, uh, the Disney Corporation which ain't going anywhere, you know, anytime soon, coronavirus or not. So um, that's how they kind of said they turned that in from originally a copyrighted work to a trademark. But in terms of copyright, where the extent of the protection is, that looking at the Tarzan example, you, you can, talking about the ability to protect creative expressions, original concepts, original creations really in it, you cannot copyright facts. You cannot copyright things in the public domain. So, because those are not protectable, anybody can use them. But you can uh, create things if you can create a compilation of things from the public domain and you get protection in that collective work, as it were. You've seen photojournalism uh, things about the Civil War with all these pictures, for example, that are in the public domain. And the book itself as a collective work is copyrightable. And so the key is if it rises to the level of copyright, then you want to protect it as your copyrighted work and you want to register it. You get a host of benefits by registering a copyrighted work. Mainly you can guard against uh, anybody using that work uh, in any manner that you have not authorized in order to do. But for where games again are concerned, in the Tarzan properties or any other properties, there's this source material. And if you write a story, for example, and this happens in modern day, you might write a story and you say, I own this story, 
what am I going to do with this store? Well, maybe I can license it to Annapurna or, you know, Douglas or somebody to make a game out of it. Maybe I can license it to Fox to make a TV show out of it or 20th Century or, you know, or Sony Pictures to make a movie out of it. Or you can do a theatrical production out of it. You as the owner of the source material have the right to license it out for people to make what are known as derivative works out of it. A game is a derivative work of the original source material. So is a movie, so is a TV show or a theatrical production. And it's no different in the world of music. You can, if you have music, if you create music, you can grant a license to a video game company to use that music in the game. It can be an original creation. A lot of gaming companies will hire contractors, for example, specifically to create music for their game. Sometimes, in the example, a good example is Grand Theft Auto, they take a lot of pre-existing works, music, and they go out and they get a license, really technically two licenses, to use that music in the video game itself. So the company, if you are a content creator, you have a, a lot of options available to you to take this stuff and you can either write material directly for a gaming company, they might hire you to do that. We can talk a little bit about that. Or you can license a pre-existing work to them, a story, a character, music, any of the above, or you can work directly for them. And I guess the thing to touch upon there is, how do you do that? So uh, basically, as a company, you might hire independent contractors. You are going to want to do it as a work for hire so that anything they develop, whether it's a written, uh, you know, whether it's a story, whether it's artwork, whether it's music, if it's a work for hire, you as the employer are going to end up owning everything and anything that they create. Same thing if they are an actual employee for you, they are creating it, you as the employer own it. So I don't know, have you guys dealt with that, Jordan Douglas, in terms of you using outside contractors to create content for you? Yeah, we definitely do. So talk about that then. Um, yeah, we I, absolutely every day. I mean, that's a major part of my job is is sort of facilitating the the contracts and the negotiations that would go into place with respect to those contractors. And it would be anything from you know our original deal with a developer, either to you know acquire their game, um, you know for us to publish, either via like an acquisition, like we're we're sort of purchasing it or hiring them to work, like he said, in a work for hire capacity where we would would actually own the results and proceeds of what they're creating or you know doing a license deal whereby we would be licensing you know their game for specific uses namely um, to publish it you know on various platforms as a video game but aside from that we hire contractors of all sorts everything like Keith was saying from you know composers who are scoring original music for our video games we do music licenses also as Keith mentioned you know meaning that we're we're you know, going after and acquiring rights to, you know, pre-existing music to put them in our games. We hire software developers or visual artists or people to do logos or, you know, you name it. And we probably hired them to, to do one thing or another on, on one of our titles in the form of, of some sort of contracted relationship. That's exactly everything Jordan said is pretty much exactly what we do as well. I mean, uh, Casey, I mean, if I, I'll bring up like a, mo a more recent case, we needed a new Tarzan theme song because Tarzan actually doesn't have a theme song. So we, we thought, we thought our title needs a theme song. So we found a composer that we really liked that had some sort of social clout online and hired them for a price as part of a soundtrack that we will also sell that's secondary to our game, more original soundtrack or, or but what we, we do focus on work for higher situations that basically where we, uh, we own, uh, as Jordan said, all the, the proceeds of the, of the work. But what we also tend to typically do with those creators, because we, all, we're all, we want people to come back to continue to want to work with us. So we typically find a way to incentivize them with some sort of royalty structure. So even though we are the owners, we are, we are sort of giving them a stake in the work that they're creating for the term of the license at the very least. I think that's a good thing to talk about though, generally, like in terms of the range of royalties, people might be content creators. So how do you, how do you approach that? If you're going to engage in uh, licensing negotiations with them for their content, how do you, what do you look for? What is important to you? And tell us about those negotiations. Oh, to negotiate 
uh, from from a, from someone who has content that we would like to license? Is that or right? or to yeah, if you want to license the content, or if you're going to say, hey, we'd like to retain you to uh, as an employee or as an independent contractor to work for hire. Gotcha. What sort of parameters do you look for in those two scenarios? Oh, well, well, if we're going to license someone's content, first of all, we, we make sure that they actually themselves own the content that we're interested in licensing. There's a lot of people that will try to sell you things that they don't own, which is uh, gets yeah, tricky. Or they'll do things like we just talked about and not have proper work for hire documentation in place. So they think they own something that somebody made for them and they don't. That's true. And I, I don't want to get too far. I, I forget the title of this one, but, and that this might be getting more into the developer side, but, but just for example, let me, let me go, but let me get a little bit bigger picture. Like when we hire a development team, a studio, we need to make sure that not that we own everything that they are making, but they also have the legal paperwork that, that everybody working in that studio also is working under that agreement as well. You know, because oftentimes as Jordan might, know that as I'm sure Jordan experiences this the studios will farm out additional work so there'll be secondary and third contractors and we need to make sure that uh, all the work created under the scope of work or under the services agreement is all contained is uh, all assignable basically back to us at the end of the job if that uh, and back to the you know someone did mention licensing um, gameplay or something with um, twitch uh, streamers and monetizing and all this stuff and I think that's really interesting, and I don't want to. That could be a panel. Anymore. That could be an entire day's panel. Yeah, yeah. Well, I just yeah, this is something I want to know too. So the attorneys are here, uh, <laughs> and, and in the chat. But um, someone I think questioned about how do we monetize, or are we allowed to monetize? If like say Jordan's company makes a game, and someone posts a YouTube video of themselves playing that game, and makes money by posting that video of themselves playing the game, is that infringement upon Jordan's? copyrighted game or is that or do they have license to do that that's my question i i will give you the quickest version and answer that i can give you okay. it is not okay to do that it is infringement and you have to consider whether or not it's fair use potentially commercialization is one factor of fair use but there are many others that the court considers as well however it's it's generally not okay to just use somebody's game the publisher i you know you, you want to talk about streamers, you know, if they're playing a, a popular game, Fortnite, for example, Epic owns that game. You cannot just play that game on, online and use it however you want. Typically, they don't enforce it. That's their prerogative. But strictly from a legal perspective, it's not okay. <laughs> yeah, I think Jessica, Jessica asked that question. I think it's a good one. Uh, yeah, no, it's a great question. You might, you might find it in the EULA, right, in the end user license agreement. Because a lot of these games are not actually sold to you, they're licensed to you, and you sign an end user license agreement, and in there it might specifically prohibit you from doing exactly that. But I think Ali also makes a good point about, you know, enforcement, right, which is what is everyone's appetite, you know, and what are their interests? And while, you know, that, that example is, is an example of something that is not allowed sort of within this this legal framework in which we're operating, it's possible that a company is not interested in enforcing it because they're deriving some sort of benefit out of that use, right? And I don't wanna cite or go to that example specifically, but I think it is something to consider like, like these legal concepts are, you know, they're, they're definitely not black and white and that's sort of inherent often to the, to just this world in which we're speaking of. But then, you know, in terms of infringement as well, you know, there, it's kind of, all this stuff is really unique and it has to kind of be viewed through the lens of, of everything on a case by case basis. And what are the interests of, of the opposing parties in that circumstance, right? Because maybe another company, you know, is not deriving a benefit or maybe they are deriving a benefit, but they also want to make a point to the greater community that, that this sort of use is, is something that they're not going to tolerate, right? And so by, you know, using enforcement mechanisms, they're, they're doing it in, in the form of posturing to send a message to the community at large, right? Another, you know, another rights holder might actually have, you know, been 
granting rights to somebody else to stream in a different way. And so then that use is somehow, you know, like an infringement on rights that they've already granted in some other way. And so they're interested in enforcing those rights because they don't want to get in trouble with whomever they've already licensed rights to elsewhere. You know, everyone has different interests. So we can talk about these things in, in a black and white legal way, but also it's important to know kind of what the case by case scenarios are as well, I think. Yeah. So, and like I say, with every client, I mean, I can, I can talk till the day is done about what you can and can't do legally, but at the end of the day, you have to not only consider the legal implications, but the practical and the business implications of all of this. You know, so. Alwi, you can address probably, you know, like in the esports world, there, you know, this comes up a lot where there's actually a requirement for, you know, for some of the streaming, but sometimes streaming these games are a negotiated point, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, required streaming time is is typically included in all esports contracts. But again, a topic that we can talk about for yeah. ad nauseum for an entire day. But it's, whole... I think it is just. I mean, it was a great question. I'm glad somebody brought it up because it just goes back to the point that this is not all mutually exclusive. The publisher has rights in the game and the gameplay, but as the streamer builds on top of that and creates their own original content, you know, on their own channel they can potentially have rights in that as well. And so it overlaps and it can become very, very complicated. And, and it's interesting also the difference in the gaming world versus the real world. Um, mm -hmm. Like the NFL, NBA, MLB, they all have broadcast rights, right? To broadcast the game. But nobody, but it, the difference is that the gaming companies, okay, own the the publishers own the gaming content and that's copyrighted material with all these characters and with the artwork and everything else that is being broadcast uh, as well which is a public display right so it's similar but different in, in the gaming context i think it's more complicated in the gaming context because they're actually using underlying copyrightable material in the streaming of it, which is a little bit different than the broadcast rights associated with a professional sports organization. Yeah, I mean, and we can go into even more, you know, these third party platforms like Twitch and what kind of rights Twitch has. But yeah, I mean, just to reiterate, it can get very, very complicated. But just because something is legally right or wrong does not mean that that's the way it's going to play out. And as far as enforcement is concerned, it's a question I get a lot of times from not only clients, but you know, infringers that we've gone after, they say, well, why me? What about everybody else? I mean, everybody else is doing this. You know, so it's, doesn't that make it okay? It's, it's no. Because yeah. this was the thing in the, mu in the music industry, more traditional industry, where after Napster came out and the RIAA, the Recording Industry Association of America, they were running around suing people all over the country for peer-to-peer -peer sharing, right? And there was a lot of outrage over it. And literally people, you know, they were screaming about why are you suing this little old lady in Arkansas who, you know, received, you know, who sent this song to her grandson or something. That's outrageous. This little old lady didn't know. And the RIAA said she does now. And because what happened is those cases generated so much publicity that copyright infringement Peer-to-peer -peer sharing is copyright infringement. It is illegal. So the strategy there was not to go after the little old lady. They did, but the overall strategy was because of the publicity involved that it got the word out that this stuff is illegal. It's copyright infringement. You can't do it. And so that adds value to the companies. Yeah, and I just want to clarify one point. I saw a comment in here that in response. I just want to clarify that the intention behind it is not necessarily relevant. Knowledge of infringement is not relevant. It's a strict liability type of issue here. If you're doing it, it's not okay. It's illegal. Yeah, and where copyrights are concerned, to bring it full circle, you know, there's always the example that we use, you know, if two chimps are on remote islands on the opposite side of the world, and they both create the exact same picture, exact same, that is not copyright infringement, okay? because it wasn't actual copying. That is one of the threshold issues in a copyright infringement case. Did the person actually copy it? And you guys, more high profile examples recently, Katy Perry, Pharrell, these types of things where they were saying, 
Well, they had access to the material. You had this huge Marvin Gaye song. Clearly Pharrell knew of Marvin Gaye, had heard the song. There was no direct evidence that he copied it, but when they broke down the song, I, I disagreed with the decision, but, but they, when they broke down the note structure, they hired a musicologist, they go, there's so many similarities here. It, it had to be copied. And how do you prove copying? He had access to it. It was a very similar thing. Gwen Stefani found herself in a similar situation recently uh, because I forgot who the artist was, but she used to be a hairdresser. And that artist actually gave her a CD back when she was a hairdresser. And they're like, look, she had access to this material. That's evidence that she actually copied. I don't mean to interrupt you. I just see a really good question came in and figure it might be a good one for uh, Doug and Jordan to touch on as it relates yeah. to work for hire. And the question is about about creating content for a game. And if you're pitching the concept to a company, does it have to be a work for hire or can you retain ownership and simply license it? And that's a point of negotiation for sure. And I think that's probably something that you two can speak to. So first of all, I think, you know, different industries have sort of different standards of practice. So traditional entertainment world, film and television, you know, tends to have a consistent standard of practice of how they would handle something like this. And then, you know, and that world, I like to think of that world, film and television and, and you know, music to some extent is like fairly standardized, right? In terms of, of the, the process of how kind of contracts get made and things get done. And then video games is, is sort of much less so. There's there's kind of more room to to kind of do alternative things. And then, and then VR, which, you know, Douglas can speak of is um, more like it's the Wild West, right? It's so new and it's, we're not really sure, you know, how how to handle certain things but I think you know taking from the film and television world and like Ali said it's like all this stuff is open to to you know negotiation right and typically you know as someone who is licensing or purchasing or, or acquiring intellectual property from somebody else you would want to acquire it you would want to own it just most of the time right because that gives you you know the greatest bundle of rights the great like the greatest enforceability you know it sort of comes along with all of these various things which then you can sort of parse out and control as the owner but if that's not on the table let's say in a certain you know type of negotiation then in which case you would be looking to a license um you know maybe you're licensing a specific use case right like i'm i'm licensing the use of this, you know, screenplay or story to make a single movie, right? And nothing else, right? Or, or a sp one video game or, you know, so that would be one way to handle it. Another way is if you did own it, maybe there were certain reserved rights that, that didn't transfer along with that purchase and they were held back by the original creator, you know? And so if you were somehow acquiring, let's say you had like a screenplay and you're acquiring the rights to to incorporate that screenplay into you know a video game or to create a video game around that world you know you might hold back certain rights you often would see that like on the you know film and tv world if in the case of a screenplay or in the case of if you were you know optioning or purchasing a book or or a, an article or something to to make a movie out of you might reserve or hold back in some way you know your publishing rights your your right to continue as an author publishing that that book in book form right or p possibly to put out you know sequels to that book so all of this stuff is kind of open to negotiation subject to negotiation and it really depends on the inherent circumstances some some publishers and some content creators you know prefer to work in different ways and it kind of depends who you're dealing with you would also look at like who are the stature of the parties are you dealing with a content creator who has a certain stature and a certain precedent where they can make demands on on their sale of their work such that they are holding back you know certain rights so it all like like i say like i've said before it all kind of depends but i think the the main message right is that it can all to some extent be negotiated which i think is a good takeaway how do you guys value a property you know if somebody comes to you or you want the property from them what goes into your consideration what factors do you apply to determine what the value of the property is in order to acquire it by sale or license or otherwise i think the first thing you would look at right is is who, who are you dealing with right like who's sitting across the table from you who 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 are the who is the person or the company or or the entity in some way that that you're trying to acquire this thing from right so is it is it part of a larger canon of work 
Is it the follow-up game from a developer who had a really, you know, successful first game? You know, is it from a new developer or a new content creator that is sort of, you know, hasn't been out on the market before, who doesn't, hasn't built a reputation that is, is independent from what you are looking to do with them? And so I think that would sort of be, you know, one thing. You also, you know, if, if you're looking, you know, and I, I look at things mostly from the business and the legal side versus the creative side, because it's, it's just not my job. But, you know, if, if you see a piece of content or a new game or a demo or some original art or something, and you're, you're really crazed about it, like you love it and it really inspires you and it's something you want to put out into the marketplace or help put out to the marketplace, help create, you know, what value is assignable to that, right? Sometimes that, that degree of value is hard to ascertain. You know, you could have, and I'm sure Douglas has kind of run into this with his background as well. Like you could have some executives that are like, I must have this thing at all costs, right? Because they have just a personal affinity for that thing, that content in some way. So I think there's a lot of different ways to ascertain value. And those are just a few of them. I'm sure Douglas, you have more examples. Uh, well, I was going to yeah. ask Douglas, yeah. Yeah. if you can address on the back end, how do you determine, look at a property and say, I can exploit this and make money out of it. What goes into that is my question. Yeah. Well, I mean, Keith, you and I had that conversation the other day about fair market value, which I think speaks to a little bit what Jordan was saying, like, what is fair market for something? We look at we look at precedent. I mean, we look at what we paid for things in the past. You know, I, I just want to go back briefly to that person that's asking about separated rights. That's our business. Our business is separated rights. We license the XR, if you want to, if you can call it XR, but we, li we license the VR, AR, and mixed reality rights for titles, or for, for, for IP. And we leave everything else to someone else because we're not in the film business. We're not in the TV business. We're not in the publishing business. The, I mean, print publishing. We're in the gaming business, so we license the gaming rights. So if someone came to us with a with a with a just an amazing idea, say say for example, uh, talking about someone of stature, uh, as Jordan was pointing out, that someone that might be more perceived to be more expensive, with you know Stephen King, I'll just throw him out there. If he came in and he said, "I want to here's my thing, and I want to license this to you." and we would just buy the gaming rights from him and we would look at the, we would see who's sitting across the table. We would value, look at the fair market value of this individual. We would look at past deals that we've done. And then we would say, okay, well, we just want these rights. And we might even go a little bit, a little bit further and say, we want, we don't want, we don't want China. You know, if we can't afford it, just these rights, we'll, we'll, we'll let China, you can have the China, the China, uh, China interactive rights and we'll just take North America and Europe, uh, or et, et cetera. But as far as how we, come to the valuation about, you know, because Jordan and I both are the kind of the business guys. I mean, I, I kind of do it all, but business is like one of the, one of the things that uh, keeps me going. And we look at, uh, we basically, in the VR business, everything is still new and nobody quite knows if it's going to take off or if it's going to like fizzle or if it's going to, or what's happening. But we do, we can look at precedent of pr previous titles. Uh, and we sort of have a database of like, well, this is what this is what a typical game. This is how much a typical virtual reality game makes, you know, on average. And we have this whole like, system for doing this, and 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 basically that will we we'll use that number to back everything into. Uh, so we determine well, how much could we pay for the license for the title? How much should can we can we make the title for? And on and on and on, you know. And uh, how much of a royalty can we afford to pay the license for? Um, and, and based on our expected revenue, based on our projections, because the, the, our business, since we're, 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 we're the, the advantage and disadvantage of what we do, both the advantage and the disadvantage is it's brand new. So there's not a lot of precedent and there's not a lot of financial history in, in this particular sector. So we're learning as we go and we kick the tires and we see who's sitting across the table from us and we, uh, and we, and we try to fair deal. Because again, if you're like, uh, to what Jordan was saying, you got to, you got to, there's a, you got to think about who's sitting across the table from you and you want people to come back. You want people to continue to do business with you. So you also have to treat them fairly and you have to get, and you have to, you know, cut them in on the successes of it. And so that's how, that's well, how well, we, if you want to treat them fairly, get rid of the attorneys, but I should, uh, I should mention this. Not um, our firm, Keith. Yeah. Except for Morrison Rothman. That's what I meant. Okay, okay. But I think it's important for uh, content creators those of you that are participating today to know the key to all of this really is registration rights. And I'll talk, Ali, you can talk about trademark registration, but copyright registration, you know, if the work is copyrightable, right? I mean, copyright registration is pretty straightforward, easy process, but 
you know, when the moment you create something, it's copyrighted. And I always get, you know, you probably get this too. We always get, well, what about this poor man's copyright? Can I put it in an envelope and mail it to myself? Yeah, that's evidence of when you created it, but there's no such thing as a poor man's copyright. It's copyrighted the second you create. Going back yeah, to I mean, the, the actual language, as soon as it's fixed in a tangible form of expression. Fixed in a tangible medium. And so it's copyrighted. In 2020, though, different than 2019, because of a recent case, uh, Supreme Court decision that came down last year, in 2020, it's like, okay, it's copyrighted. So what? Unless and until you register the copyright, you take the time to get a copyright registration, you cannot enforce your copyrights. That was the Supreme Court decision. N not in front of a, yeah, not in front of a court, you can't. You can't file not a court. court but even, even in the absence of that, okay, the registration of your copyright as value, it entitles you to statutory damages, which can be anywhere from $750 per infringement up to $30,000 per infringement, or for willful infringement, up to $150,000 per infringement. So, you know, you can define what is and what is not an infringement, how many are they successive. But the point is, you, there's, you get statutory damages. You also get, there's a prevailing party provision in there, which says if you prevail in your copyright infringement lawsuit, you get your attorney fees back as well. And so registering your copyright is a very important step in copy, owning a copyright. Ali, you can talk about trademark reg. Yeah, I mean, similarly to copyright, you have what's called as common law rights and trademark as soon as you start using the mark in commerce. So as soon as it's released on the app store, however you're going to distribute it. But there's obviously benefits to registration or else nobody would do it. And, you know, similarly to copyright, one of those benefits is the, the benefit of having access to statutory damages in the event that you have to enforce it with a lawsuit. And those damages are quite hefty. Otherwise, without that, you have to prove how much you've actually been damaged by any sort of infringement. And sometimes that can be very challenging. So having access to, you know, and when I say statutory damages, just in case you guys don't know, it's just automatic number that you get in terms of money if you can prove that somebody infringed your rights. So you don't have to show anything. You don't have to prove that, you know, you lost sales, for example, of X dollars. You just get the amount of money that the statute says that you get. So, yeah. It's great in the copyright sense where music is concerned. I love these stories. You, you guys may have heard of ASCAP and BMI. Uh, they enforce uh, performance royalties for composers of music. And you, if you're a composer of music, you would register that your song with ASCAP or BMI. And what they do, they would sit in a public performance of a song in a bar, in a restaurant, uh, in in at the Staples Center, I don't care. Okay, you have to have a license. It's called a blanket license through ASCAP and BMI to publicly perform that song. In other words, people are paying to get into your bar or whatever, and the music is there as a service. That's a public performance. What these guys from ASCAP and BMI would do, they would walk in in their little, you know, hat, glasses, and trench coat. They would order a beer. They would sit at the end of the bar, and they would have a notepad. And they would sit there and nobody would know what they're doing. The bartender's going around doing things and there's just this nerd sitting on the end of the bar jotting things down. And at the end of the night, that nerd would walk up to the owner of the bar and said, hey, I noticed you don't have an ASCAP or license here. Uh, during the course of this evening, you played 30 songs that are registered with ASCAP. That's $30,000 per infringement. That's $900,000. Is the math right? I don't know. But, you know, do you want to buy the blanket license now or do you want to pay the $900,000 in statutory penalty? That's how this stuff works in practice where music is concerned. But even without the ASCAP BMI thing, you want to own this stuff. Douglas and Jordan are going to make sure they're going to ask you to warrant and represent that you own the copyrights in and to the music, that you have the right to grant the license to them. And if it turns out you don't, you are also going to be asked contractually to indemnify them. So when the real owner comes along and says, hey, Jordan, your company is infringing my copyright, 
in my music, I am suing you. Jordan will then turn around to the to, to you guys out there that purportedly own this stuff and said, well, guess what? You now have to defend me and indemnify me against this lawsuit, which means you have to not only pay for the defense of the lawsuit and hire a lawyer to do that, you also have to pay the judgment of any amount of money that we get hit with because we've infringed upon that work. So it's important to make sure that you properly own this stuff, that you've registered the copyright on it, and ultimately that's how you go about protecting some of these rights. Yeah, and I think just the last thing that I would add, I know we're a little bit over time, is to quote my partner, Ryan Morrison, a trademark is both a sword and a shield. So it stops people from coming after you and allows you to go after other people to stop them from using your mark. And when you register, and this goes for copyright and trademark, it's, it's available to the public. So nobody has the excuse that they didn't know. And that's how the law will see yeah, it as well. Does fan art infringe on the artist's copyright? Fan art is technically not okay either. It's just one of those things that a lot of developers and rights holders choose not to enforce on because they, you know, they're fans and you don't want to, your, your fans are giving you good promotion. Those are not the people that you want to go after for the most part. Similar goes with cosplay and, and, and that type of use. Is that what you guys have seen too in your experience? Have you had any issues with fan art? No, not really. I mean, we, we haven't had any issues like that. I mean, maybe Jordan those guys have we we haven't we encourage it we don't know we yeah uh, that's... any any anything and uh well we do have a we we, we will have an issue do have an issue if if, if it's monetized uh yeah but, but that's where a lot of clients seem to want. draw the line but yeah i mean generally speaking it's it's good for your brand and again at the end of the day totally. like i said yeah it's legal versus business and practical implications and having that type of attention is is usually good and, and because, not because we're just greedy guys who want to make <laughs> money on everything, it's because we have an obligation to our licensors. I mean, we license things. So our licensors and our development teams, and the, we, we have everybody participating in the, re, in the revenue from the property or the work, you know, the work. So we, all those people, our job is to make sure that all those people are f fairly compensated for the work. And if someone is monetizing something, a you know, a derivative work, I guess that would be a derivative work of... Of, of our title, then the, all those other people that we're kind of, we have to, we're, we're, we have a duty to, does not allow us to, to let that happen or continue. I wanted to just thank Keith, Allison, Douglas, and Jordan for your time and your expertise. Thank everybody here for joining California Lawyers for the Arts this evening.